and women in power kerala chapter uh, uh, and we held a program uh, called net zero homes so it was a uh, workshop completely uh, attended by the women folks of a local area so it, it was an intervention on the local um, side in the ground as, uh, what you call the grassroots level so how you can intervene to make your home energy efficient how you can reduce your your emissions so this will be a, a, a an important subject because the transition is going on from the the uh, the fossil fuel side to the clean energy side so everywhere every national governments un and all scientists are working towards this i to play is all set for working on this we have been conducting a lot of programs i to play ps chapter especially uh, conduct a lot of programs as part of ps day environment day celebrations so i'm um, i'm not um, elaborating my speak uh, my speech and uh, dean um, we are privileged to get you on this great talk and we are very thankful to you in this late evening you are joining from australia uh, my i'm welcoming you best wishes from ps sir thank you over to sohair sir for the introduction because sohair sir yeah. is very close to you yeah please so yes sir yeah you can have an introduction to our uh, chief guest now yeah good evening everybody professor jean professor vk damar sir my esteemed leaders of ps kerala chapter one of the missions of uh, pes power and society is to help the members stay tuned to the technology and this uh, ps distribution lecture program is uh, designed to meet that target to facilitate renowned speakers members specialists to address or to go to the chapters and address the members and empower them by sharing the latest trends in technology and this ps distinguished lecture program is essential for winning the outstanding chapter award so this is a must program for every uh, chapter to excel and serve the members in the best manner possible i am delighted that the first dlp chapter of uh, ps kerala chapter is a speaker is none other than dean sharafi who needs no introduction to kerala chapter everybody knows about him and i think i first met him in 2017 in bangalore he has been for the last 6 years in the board of directors of pes and he has been encouraging motivating ps kerala chapter to excel he, he is closely monitoring our activities here and encouraging us to do more and more things during his tenure kerala chapter twice won the outstanding chapter award for the activities in 2017 we were awarded outstanding chapter award in 2018 and for the activities in 2021 we won the award in 2022 and a pitch to 2021 we kerala got it purely out of the interest of dean sarafi he said you should do it and you can do it so all the time he was encouraging and supporting and he was recommending us so he has been like a mentor and a, a, a close friend and advisor who has been very keen to see how kerala to excel and uh, prove to his uh, desire we have almost reached 5000 in two years ago membership there is some temporary dip but we are compensating we have excellent teams in the women in engineer women, women in power psyp all youngsters every 
category of membership. PS Kerala chapter is uh, doing wonderful things, associating with the chapter, other organizations, LMAG, so many other affinity groups. And we are collaborating and cooperating with all entities of IEEE and other professional societies, the society. We are also involved in social engagements, trying to help the society. So we have been actually been a model of how a professional society, a technical society, can serve the society at large. Professor Vicky Damodaran has been our advisor and mentor. He has been with us in every activity, guiding us with his immense experience and So we are moving forward. We know that Dean Sharafi is a big boss in AMO, Australian energy market operator. And uh, he has held very high positions. You have seen his profile already. He has been a very active volunteer in ITPLA. And we hope that uh, you, you may know that he's contesting uh, in, in the top level of ITPLA. PS positions, and we should not forget to cast a vote, and we want him to be at the leadership level, helping us again and again, and supporting us to move forward. With these few words, I am cutting down my speech, wishing you, wish you a very entertaining, knowledgeable session with Dean Sharafi. Thank you, sir for sparing your time with us. Thank you everybody for participating. It's a very wonderful topic that he's talking today, today today's towards net zero, challenges of energy transition, a very re relevant contemporary topic. And I hope all of us will be benefited by his lecture. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Tohir, sir. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, uh, so, uh, Mr. Dean Sharafi, and your platform is yours. You can handle the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Sohair. Thanks, Dr. Ajit and Mr. Rahul. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, definitely, Kerala chapter is the chapter that I, I feel very close with. So, uh, let, let me. Um, bring up my presentation and uh, I, I hope the topic um, is um, relevant enough to India, definitely relevant to uh, many countries in the world that have a net zero targets. So let me start with uh, a picture here. Um, I hope you can you can see if you can confirm please you can see the screen well so I continue yes yes okay okay great so um, this is um, this is an eclipse that we had on twentieth of April um, covering. Western Australia, and, and you can see this is a satellite image of Australia, and on the west side, you, you can see a, a big black darkness here because of the eclipse. But why, why is it important? I, I will come back to it. You know, maybe a decade ago, at an eclipse uh, wouldn't be so important to the power system, but nowadays it is, and it is very important for Western Australia, where, where I live. But yeah, I'll come back to this. But let's ask a question. Are we responsible for CO2 emissions? So when I say we, I, I mean human beings. Are human beings responsible for emissions? I think there are not many climate change deniers anymore, but uh, this graph shows this graph shows the CO2 emissions since 1750, but most importantly, since the Industrial Revolution. Here you can see that 
the CO2 emissions have risen drastically compared to uh, the years before. So from 1750 to almost um, in, in the, the late uh, 1800s, that there was no CO2 emissions, but as we went through the industrial age, suddenly the CO2 emissions have risen. So it has a really close relevance to the temperature rise on Earth. And, and you, can, you can see while this graph is not exactly same as that one, but you can see the trend. The trend is pretty much same as the CO2 emissions. So the climate change is the effect of CO2 emissions. And, and what, that is what makes our job really very important. So what our industry is doing about it is also very relevant and uh, important to see. So this graph shows the investment in clean energy from 2015 up to now. And, and as you can see, the clean energy uh, investment has grown year after year and, and have really surpassed uh, investment in fossil fuels. So this is re the response that we have provided to the issue of emissions and climate change. In the same way, the old production investment has really reduced compared with investment in solar. So the, the the dark blue shows investment in solar 10 years ago. And you can see now the investment is as almost as much as uh, investment in global oil production. And this is the graph showing the increase in annual clean energy investment. And well, China is, is the first country then European Union, and India is only after Japan in the investment. So you folks in India are really doing very well in that regard. And, and you can see here the level of investment in clean energy globally. So if I go by um, the type of investment, since 2015, you can see we have invested year after year in renewable power, in energy efficiency, in, uh, in grids, which involves the storage, in electric vehicle, battery storage, and nuclear energy. And this sort of investment is going to accelerate into the future. You can see here, year after year, from 2020, uh, the in investment in solar, wind, hydro, even nuclear is increasing, while investment in coal is reducing, which is really a very encouraging effect because most of the greenhouse effects emissions are related to coal energy production. And, and we have to get out of coal as quickly as we can. I'm, I'm showing the graph of how the prices, the average prices of technology have come down over the years. And, and you can see since 2020, almost the prices of each renewable technology have leveled. So we are going into a very stabilized air for the green energy and the prices are going to be stable going forward. So we are going to see um, very stable trends from here onwards. But let me talk about Australia, talk about Australian energy market operator a little bit because I'm going to take you through uh, what we have here in, in Western Australia and the grid. So um, you need to know a little bit about this. Australia has two grids that they are not interconnected. One grid, which is the 
longest grid in the world actually is on the east coast of Australia and you can see it here on the east uh, here and the other grid is in the western Australian western Australian state and this is the grid that I'm going to uh, mostly focus on uh, because it is a grid with very high penetration of renewables and no interconnection so the effect of uh, energy transition is felt really uh, very, very hard here. And I'll take you through some of these challenges. So, so this, is, this is the actual grid uh, that uh, I, I talk about. In terms of geography, it is equivalent uh, to the size of United Kingdom. So it, it is relatively large, um, but um, this grid serves about two million people, two, two and a half million people. So in terms of load, it's not really a big load. So here is the mix of generation that we have, about 35% coal, about 30 to 35% gas, and wind, 30% wind, and uh, the, the rest, and, and you, you can see that uh, still we have some sh share of coal generation, but it is going to be retired over the years. And by 2030, there will be no coal in this state. The share of energy, the total generation has increased year after year for wind and, and for solar. So you, you can see the wind in green here, and solar in yellow, uh, grid scale and distributed solar. And, and you can see there is a large distributed solar uh, component in the energy mix here. I'm sure you know about the um, dock curve and, and we do have a very deep dock curve. So the, this is uh, the, the shape of uh, load and the area under the yellow here <laughs> is all uh, supplied by rooftop PV. So people have uh, solar panels on their roof. Every third home in Western Australia has a solar panel and they generate during the day. And then the, the load, the operational demand comes up very, very low. So on this day, you can see that this is the operational demand of one state is about 760 megawatt, which is, which is quite low. And uh, if, if this goes lower, the system becomes uncontrollable. And you can see at this time, around 70% of the load was supplied by rooftop PV. So people, houses. So we are on the way to 100% rene renewable. Theoretically, we could supply all the load with the renewable energy that we have if you ignore the effect of the electricity market. But of course, you know, we as the system operator will not allow this to happen because it's not only about the energy. We need uh, other ancillary services, things that make the power system stable uh, also needed. So we, we can't allow this to happen, but if we could have this sort of situation uh, on, on this day, we could uh, supply the load with 100% renewable. I'm, I'm sure uh, it is uh, same in India, but the Australian federal government pledged that they will keep the emissions they will reduce emissions by 43% compared to 2005 levels by 2030 and to net zero by 2050. And a lot of governments in the world have the net zero 2050 targets. In Western Australia, there is also this more aggressive emissions. So we want to cut emissions by 80% by 2030. That's in seven years from now, and then to net zero by 2050. So all of these um, 
targets and the push for renewables really create a lot of system challenges. But let me go through these very quickly. So we see uh, big load swings with high levels of uh, rooftop solar. And I'll show you a couple of graphs about this. We have seen, um, I showed you the graph of lowering levels of minimum operational demand. And, and as, as you know, you can, you can go uh, low so much, and then after that, the system becomes unstable. We have fewer synchronous dispatchable generator online to sustain power system security and reliability, because when the rooftop solar uh, are in high generation, we have to uh, disconnect or uh, turn off the synchronous generation to allow room for those generation from rooftop to appear in the grid. And we have lower, lower levels of system inertia as a result. So if synchronous generation is not producing, then the inertia level on the system becomes very low. What happens when uh, this synchronous generation are not available, then we have a change of frequency and the rate of change of frequency can become very high, then management of frequency becomes very difficult. All of these will affect market. And in those conditions, either market is operating at, at the minimum or uh, somehow uh, becomes very difficult to choose between those generators that all bid to the minimum level of the market. So in our system, non-synchronous renewable generation will soon exceed synchronous generation. And this make us think what we need to do to manage that situation. Uh, year after year, we have seen uh, stronger growth in, in solar generation. And we can see that every day, there is one megawatt that goes on people's rooftop. So this is very briefly the, the challenges, and I'll go through um, one or two challenges in, in more detail, but let me show you what happens with, with the prices. So this is the newspaper that um, showed um, a couple of months ago what, what happened on the East Coast of Australia because the prices were, were so high that people couldn't afford to turn on the, their heating and, and they kept themselves warm with um, you know, blankets and rugs. And, and th this is a funny picture, but this is uh, really true for some uh, residents in, in some cities. So let, it, let me bring it back to India. What, why is energy transition important for India? Here we can see different phases of renewable energy integration. And you, you can see uh, phase one, uh, very low um, penetration of renewables. I have Indonesia here, uh, but uh, you, you even can't see uh, the, the graph here, but let's focus on phase two, three, and four. So phase two is where there are mod minor or moderate impact on power system operation. And, and India is here, it's still in phase two as a country, but th there is phase three and, and phase four. So you can see here, for example, Denmark, South Australia and Ireland in this phase four, high level of penetration. Our state, Western Australia is also here, maybe even ahead of Denmark, but it wasn't part of this study, so it's not shown here. But we can see uh, Karnataka as a state in India is in phase three. And then you can see 
three other Indian states here, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, and Gujarat is also here. So India as a country will soon find itself in phase three of this, and then in phase three, uh, variable renewable energy will really dominate the, the power system operation. And, and you know, in everything that um, you need to do to operate the power system, they become very important factors. So why is it important? We know, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if uh, the level of seniority uh, with the audience is really very high, but I, I need to explain this very basic principle that frequency is really important for power system operation. Uh, it's a measure of health of the grid and uh, it, it's a supply demand balance. Uh, what happens, um, we need to have a stability in, a frequent, in, in the frequency of the system and we need to be able to come back to a stable situation all the time if uh, the system is subjected to a uh, contingency and, and the system has to be able to recover. So let me tell you what happens in Western Australia where the, there is a lot of uh, rooftop solar. So you can see in, in this condition, uh, the demand and supply are in balance. So we have a very healthy frequency, 50 Hertz. But during the day, when the, the solar PV is in generation, you can, you can see the uh, solar contribution comes on the supply side. So everything is okay, no, nothing is wrong with it. But if we have a fault, we, if we have a fault on a, a power system, for example, and the power system trips, then what happened? The balance between supply and demand is affected and no demand is bigger than supply. So frequency is less than 50 Hertz. But the effect of PV is that due to either voltage or frequency disturbance, some of these distributed PV will also trip and, and make the situation even worse. And, and sometimes this shortfall in supply is that we may go into under frequency load shedding. It hasn't happened yet because we have been vigilant and we have been monitoring this situation to see what needs to be done to manage this situation. There are also market impacts. So there will be increased market costs for frequency control ancillary services for the spinning reserve and for distributed PV curtailment. There is a risk related to non-credible contingencies. Now it's, it's not only one generator that is failing. Maybe there are so many of these small generators that people have that they also trip and make the situation worse. And then what, if, if this situation continues, we will have reduced capacity in the grid to uh, make, uh, to accommodate new uh, rooftop solar. The other challenge is with cloud coverage. And as, as you know, um, if, the biggest generator on the system is your rooftop solar, then if the cloud comes in and suddenly moves, then there is a lot of movement in the generation. And, and sometimes you can see that frequency is affected. So in this situation that I'm showing you with the cloud movement, you can see that the frequency um, goes up and down. So if you look at the the frequency chart on the right side, it, it has gone really up and down so quickly with the cloud coverage. So this is a graph for a perfect sunny day. You, you know, it's everything is predictable. We can forecast, we can be prepared for 
the distributed PV that uh, are on people's rooftop. But in a cloudy day, uh, the forecasting becomes really a challenge because you, you can't exactly forecast when the, the clouds are going to cover the uh, most of the uh, solar panel and you can see the increase in load and, and sudden decreases. So uh, this presents a very challenging day for power system operation. Sometimes you get very tight supply conditions. So this, this is the graph of almost two weeks in June. And, and, you, and you can see, um, you know, in some days, if I, if I focus on, on these three days here and make them bigger, you, you, you can see um, here uh, the, the green part is the wind, but for, for these, three, four days, almost there is no wind. So um, it is winter here. There, there is um, reliance on, on the wind that uh, needs to supply the load. But if there is no wind, then uh, the, the system becomes very challenging because you need to have enough generation, enough dispatchable generation to supply the load. And as you can see, there was like three full days of very low wind, cold day, cold nights, short days. Uh, even if you have a storage, you don't have um, enough um, time during the day to uh, charge your batteries. And when there is no wind, here we had to run diesel to, to manage the load. So, so this... Um, orange bit here that is shown are, are diesel generation, which ideally we should never run. And, and, and you can see sometimes um, the, the, the wind, uh, so, so these um, teal color shows, shows the wind and how much wind is available uh, during system load condition. And, and you can see when system load condition increases, necessarily you don't have enough wind to, to supply the load. And um, when there is no wind <laughs> and, and um, you have to run diesel, of course, the, the prices go really high. And, and you, know, you can see that the hikes in prices, uh, this shows like $300 per megawatt hour, which is quite expensive. So um, I have spoken a lot about the challenges of energy transition, but what are we doing about it? So since uh, three, four years ago, we focused on these challenges and um, AIMO has developed a, an engineering framework, which looks at how we can manage these challenges going forward and ensure uh, we have a safe transition to 100% renewables. So there, there are some publications regarding the engineering framework, which if you're interested, you can find on AMOS website. Uh, but there is also a roadmap, a roadmap to 100% renewables. And this roadmap is focused towards three main elements. And those three are system security, system operability, resource adequacy, and capability. So I go through this very quickly. We are going to address uh, system strength um, solutions because uh, with renewable energy, um, the system strengths um, becoming very low level to the very low levels. But uh, if we address them to the equivalent of 40 synchronous condensers on the east coast of Australia, we will have adequate system strength in all parts of the grid. Energy transition and renewable energy also affects system restart process. So if 
there were to be a blackout, it will be really hard to recover from the blackout because uh, if the, it is during the day, uh, there may not be a stable load to energize the system because of the solar generation. So we need to we needed to rethink how we restart the system, the path of restart, and how we can get the stable load to restart the system. The um, renewable energy requires a lot of transmission build and the integrated system plan that AIMO has uh, highlights where those transmission infrastructure need to go to connect the new renewables that are coming onto the system. We have focused on the requirement for uh, inverters and, and what they need to do in terms of capability to not put the system at risk, but support the system. So since 2020, we have put together a new Australian standard, AS4777, which highlights the requirements for all inverters, distribution inverters, and how they need to behave in system abnormal conditions and how they can support the system through those conditions. Of course, um, energy transition also needs a smart grid and we need to modernize the grid, especially distribution, because a lot of the smart things can be done to distribution and network. Homes and also the loads that they are there, the distributed energy resources, uh, batteries that are behind the meter, and everything, if they can make, they can be smart, they can align with the times that energy is available on the grid. And they can, um, so they, they can somehow become uh, very coordinated with the energy that is available and the times that energy is abandoned. We have uplifted our operational capability and, and we have started a new project to identify what are those capabilities that we need to operate the grid in terms of tools, in terms of systems, and, and when those are required. Also, I'm sure that you're familiar with the topic of resilience that becomes has become very important for all the grids uh, because of climate change and also because of the renewable energy impact that um, may affect the, the power system. So we are uh, coordinating our approach to resiliency planning of the grid. So all of these are the solutions to the challenges that we are seeing. And, and uh, by putting those solutions in place at the right time, we are hoping that we go to the 100% renewables and through that transition, we are going to have a safe and reliable systems and um, no, nothing will happen through that transition that affects the power system in a bad way. So that is my presentation. Thank you so much for um, listening and also I would um, like to ask so if you haven't if you are a PS member if you haven't voted please vote I have a link here and I will put that link into the chat here so it seems that um, I'll bring it up and put it here for everyone. If um, if you haven't voted, please vote. I'm not saying <laughs> vote for me, but please vote because this is your right to vote. So thank you very much for listening.
Thank you, Dean. Um, it was a great session. And before moving to the Q&A, uh, uh, I request uh, our honorable mentor uh, of IEEE PS chapter, Professor B.K. Damodaran is here. He can initiate the discussion um, um, uh, just uh, by uh, a comment from uh, about the DLP from Professor B.K. Damodaran. And sir, kindly take over, sir. Uh, no, <laughs> you control the discussion. I'll just make uh, some brief comments. Yes, 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 uh, please. In fact, uh, the presentation was, uh, I should say, very well prepared, extremely ordered, and uh, very meaningful. I should thank uh, uh, Dean for uh, all the uh, trouble he has taken to present it in such a manner. It is actually very relevant, and uh, this renewables alone uh, serving has a lot of limitations because there are certain inherent problems associated with that. And he has actually put his uh, uh, sight into some of those and presented. When we come to systems that we have in Kerala or in many other Indian states, uh, we have a little problem about uh, this kind of technical control because many a time our consumers, uh, they have a little um, problem understanding some of these technical health factors of the grid. Uh, because they are uh, very much not very industrial consumers, of course, uh, this is probably the best. And I still remember in 1997, when I visited Singapore Power with our then Power Minister, uh, we had actually seen exactly how at that time, computerized uh, electricity market was working, how the maintenance work was actually being uh, digitized and a lot of things, even at that time there. But at that time in India, we did not have much of that kind of things. But now we have actually entered into this for a number of years. We were into this market, whereas uh, Dean and the Australia, as well as Singapore and many other countries, they have actually long experience in uh, managing electricity uh, markets, because this market concept itself is actually uh, was not there in India, because uh, we considered this as an essential commodity. And that was actually our uh, acts and rules were uh, set for that kind of a service to the people. And people are still not realized that it is not a service, but it is something uh, it's actually a commercial operation where each one should see. So this is one difficulty. And because of that one, I find that uh, the electricity companies in India, they find it a bit difficult to choose the energy sources. Because that, again, the, the stability of the power system and switching in and switching out power when demands vary violently. This is uh, very much to do with uh, the kind of source you are going to connect. And there should be little pre-planning for that. And uh, I think that is one issue that probably the PES people here in Kerala section, as well as in other uh, Indian PES units, they should actually try to involve and take lessons from what uh, people like uh, veterans like uh, Dean Sharafi has actually done in Australia, as well as in whole of South Asia, his approach has influenced, we know, for, for the past uh, several years. So we have to actually take cues from that. And we should actually arrange even some of our student projects, as well as some faculty also should actually 
involved in these studies, then I think we will be able to move very swiftly into an ideal system where he has actually shown how certain particular problems have been solved. So I think um, this was a real good eye opener for us. And I think it is a burden and a challenge on the PS unit to see that you are involved in solving the problems of our KCBL and similar state power companies. So thank you, thank you so much. And for thank giving you. this opportunity, I think uh, uh, Suhair and so many others who have a lot of experience in power system outside of our country as well, they'll be able to probably add to or even uh, take and pick some points from uh, Dean's speech, uh, which would be of relevance to us in our journey henceforth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Damodaran, sir. Um, sir, there's a question in chat box. Um, I can read you. So, um, for that, uh, so do you have any uh, ma mandatory inertia limit in your system now, and how have you arrived at it? As Sunil Nair is asking. Yeah, that, regarding that, the inertia really, limit. That's really a good question. Um, because, you know, the level of inertia in any system is depending on the size of the system. So in, in Western Australia, we have um, a minimum limit and a maximum limit. So, uh, and it's, um, we, 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 I, I can't explain roughly how we have come to this level, um, but um, the, the minimum level is about 10,000 megawatt second and maximum level is about 37,000 megawatt seven. Uh, second and um, it, it is um, and uh, based on uh, the um, generators that uh, have to be kept online to um, maintain that level, uh, but uh, the uh, that level is based on swing equations that our engineers have developed and. It is intended to keep the rate of change of frequency to below one hertz per second. So um, it, it is a formula. So it, it is an engineering. So I, I can't really explain it in uh, uh, this uh, session. But um, uh, it, I think it, uh, for, for every system, the level is different. But then. Uh, may, maybe what, what is important, maybe I can mention here that uh, we will have a new market uh, about the rate of change of frequency. We, we call it the rock of market. And then um, it requires generators to comply with uh, the rate of change of frequency that we set. And, and we have levels of uh, these uh, values that uh, all, all the equipment in the system have to have to follow. So it is true that uh, swing equation. Um, I mean, if you're really interested, you can communicate with me, and I can send you the, the papers how we arrived at that level. Uh, but we have presented some papers in Seagray and in IEEE on that, and I'll be happy to provide that to you if you like. Um, okay, I, I can I can read that, that there is another question whether frequency ancillary services is a separate market. Yes, yes. So um, here in WA currently we have an, uh, three sort of markets. So one is the capacity market, the other one is the energy market, and the third one is the frequency ancillary services market. So the um, the other question, if I may, um, it's um, it's a long one. I would like to know how the reactive power is managed by AIMO. Um, who is responsible for managing? Okay, okay. So the the reactive power is um, managed 
uh, both by AIMO and uh, transmission uh, network service providers. Uh, so AIMO is the independent service, uh, independent system operator. But in Australia, there are uh, also transmission and distribution network service providers. So reactive power is a mutual responsibility and uh, both AIMO and uh, we call it TNSP's transmission network service provider manage the reactive power. The 40 synchronous condensers that I mentioned is the plan for replacement of uh, synchronous condenser, uh, synchronous generators that are going to retire. So then those synchronous condensers will replace um, them uh, to maintain the short circuit level and also maintain inertia. They are not all in the system. Uh, uh, we have four in South Australia in different parts and uh, th there are some going also in the East Coast of Australia, but 40 is the uh, number that we are um, going to plan for eventually when a synchronous, uh, synchronous machines retire. So the other question is, how voltage disturbance is managed when 40% uncertainty associated with cloud movement as frequency um, and cellular service is mentioned? So management of voltage is actually is uh, a challenge because it relates to um, how much uh, distribution generation is there. We can see that during the day when distribution um, generation is high, the voltage gets really very high. And uh, this will be chal a challenge because the transformers run out of taps. And uh, this was faced um, firstly in the state of South Australia, uh, but since then um, reactors were installed and those reactors have uh, managed the voltage uh, to uh, rel relatively um, manageable level within the limits. Uh, in, in the state of Western Australia, uh, because of the low load, sometimes we had to disconnect some transmission line to keep the voltage within the limit. So management of voltage is also a topic of, uh, um, it maybe requires it, its own session, but it is a huge topic and it is very difficult. Uh, and um, at previously we had capacitors on the system. No, those capacitors never uh, are never connected because they are not required, but we have installed um, reactors, reactors on the system to keep the voltage to that level. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And thank you, Najada, for the question. Uh, so, short, uh, I think the it is a final lap. Uh, shall we have a group photo if if possible? If everyone can show your videos so we can have a group snap and we can let go. Yeah. Hello. So, everyone, please. Yeah, Sibu Saraya, please. Can I have a question, please? Yeah. Sir, uh, shall we take a snap and we can ask, sir? Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. Just a second. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, Sibu sir, yeah, please, sir. Hello, sir. Sir, uh, myself, Sibu MS belongs to the Space Department of India. Uh, thank you for the, your nice presentation. And I guess uh, you are very much uh, uh, 
aware of uh, our world energy renewable programs and my question is uh, regarding the gravity based mechanical storage uh, the, i think just some startups already started uh, in australia can you tell uh, the performance of this uh, mechanical storage system and how e is it benefitable uh, than the uh, asset storage or some other uh, uh, storage systems so, sorry let let me understand i i talked about mechanical storage sir Yes, it is a gravity gravity based mechanical storage. Oh, Some right. startups have already started in Australia. Okay, gravity based. Yes, my, my can you tell something? Been... Uh, tell something about the performance and uh, the benefits. Do you do you uh, share something about it? My, my knowledge about gravity based storage is very limited. Sorry, I can't answer that question. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Dean, uh, can you can you take one more question? Actually, in chat yeah. box. Uh, oh, okay. Um, this. Uh, Mr. Sunil Nair is asking the plan of net zero at 2030 means that duck curve will be touching zero megawatt during daytime. Is it right? How we are planning <laughs> to address this bias volatility? Yeah. Sunil Nair is okay, that, that's, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So we were um, expecting something like this to happen because we, we thought uh, the um, the dock curve is getting deeper and deeper every year and, and how far it can go. But there is one other effect that is going against this and that is electrification. And we anticipate that in a couple of years, the effect of electrification is going to be more dominant than the distributed generation. So dock curve is going to be a question of past. Because in Australia, we can see that a lot of businesses are electrifying and there are a lot, lot of electric vehicles now on the road. So the government is incentivizing electric vehicles and these are going to be plugged in during the day and the dock curve issue will go away. So we don't anticipate that it's going to go to zero. <laughs> Dean, uh, I have a question uh, to you. Sure. Uh, uh, South Australia actually first experimented with the, the st big storage systems. Uh, yeah, I, I think you know about the Elon Musk experiment of 100 megawatts yes. uh, storage system there. And at times they, sometimes uh, of, the of the period, they even the renewable energy top the generations. Uh, but uh, it's it's difficult uh, as you have shown some slides where diesel has been replacing the total uh, because of the wind is not available because of the anomaly of wind. So uh, it was an exciting experiment in South Australia. A lot of uh, countries are copying. And according to you, how how successful it is, and how we can make it more dispatchable. Yeah, the, the storage in South Australia has been very successful in providing ancillary services and also providing load shifting. So uh, through the arbitrage that it's doing, it's um, shifting the load during the times that uh, the generation, the renewable generation is very high. And then it provides that energy back into the system when it's needed during peak times. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you know that in South Australia, the penetration of renewals is 140%. Oh. Uh, and yes, and, and if South Australia was not connected to uh, the Eastern state, actually that state would have become really unmanageable with that level of renewable generation. But the state is connected, so all this renewable generation is going uh, is being exported 
to other states like Victoria or the rest of the NEM, the national electricity market. But the experience with the battery that we had in South Australia has been really very successful uh, because um, as I mentioned, the two types of services that it provides, energy and ancillary services, both have been very effective in keeping the South Australian system very secure. Excellent. Actually, uh, it's exciting news to see that after after three four years of successful commissioning, it's it's going going good and giving uh, good signs to copy. <laughs> Thank you. I, if I knew you were interested, I could show some of the uh, performance of the uh, battery in in South Australia. We have we have had some events, and when you look at the performance it actually mirrors the frequency very, very closely. So when frequency goes down, the battery goes up. It when frequency moment. goes up. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Actually, we were looking at such instances, uh, especially looking at BSS. Yes. When people are, even India is now going for uh, utility scale battery storage. So yes, we they are look doing... forward for all such events from Australia. They're, they're really great in responding to frequency changes. Right. It's, it's really... we, we always look for uh, the solar uh, implementations and the uh, integration into the system when it goes high and high. We always look at Australia. How is it going? How is it tackling? <laughs> <laughs> so this is something great. Thank you for coming over. We're meeting Thank after you. a long Thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Pijina uh, has been our, uh, our powerful fast chair. Fast chair and powerful we mentor. have had several mail contacts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, uh, nice, nice to meet you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, um, uh, Dr. Pijina here. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much. So uh, thank you, thank you, Vijana, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I I think we can wind up, sir. Right, sir. Ajit, sir. Yeah. Yes, I think I think so. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you can uh, you can have the that word of thanks opportunity, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rahul, and uh, thank you, Dean um, uh, Sarafi. Um, Sir, actually, we are uh, we are very happy to be to attend your uh, exciting session uh, on the very relevant topic on net zero and the energy transition. Um, and I triple Power Energy Society Kerala chapter uh, is very proud to have you here. And uh, as we were actually expecting around thirty plus crowd, we had. 40 plus, <laughs> that is also a wonderful thing. And we had excellent um, listeners to you, including uh, Soher Sar, our immediate past chair, Professor VK Damodaran Sar, our mentor, Dr. Bijina, our, our vice chair, Dr. Bobby Phillips Sar, PS vice chair, Dr. Bobby Phillips Sar, Dr. Bobby Phillips Sar, and, uh, and, we, and Hadiku Marviki, our secretary, um, I, I guess our Shobhama Nikhil Ma'am is also here. Uh, all the veterans here and all the students here, um, we are really benefited. Really, really, it was a great one. Uh, we look forward to, um, to, to more sessions on this side um, because we are also in the same path of energy transition. Uh, we, we actually see all these things, all, all solutions done by the uh, uh, the governments and um, the utilities to address or to to achieve the uh, 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 the target towards net zero is exciting to us because these are lessons to us. We we would like to copy also <laughs> all these things to with, with, with including our innovations as well. So uh, thank you so much um, for. Uh, this opportunity and to get you here 
and all the very best from Kerala PS uh, chapter, Power Energy Society chapter for the elections. Uh, Thank you. Best wishes, sir. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for listening. Have a nice evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have Thank a good you. Night. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit Gobi, sir. And thank you, Rahul. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Vidhan.